So I'm going to talk to you for a bit about uh, dishonest, corrupt, selfish behaviours and what behavioural science can tell us about those. And I'll give you a slightly more detailed introduction to myself uh, in a moment. But before I do that, I just wanted to jump straight into a bit of a pop quiz. So if you could just humour me for a few minutes uh, and just by show of hands, answer a few questions. So number one, imagine you're about to buy a new belt for $15.99 and you realize the exact same belt is available for $8.99 in another shop a 10 minute walk away. How many of you would walk to the other shop to get the cheaper belt? All right, that's the vast majority of you, great. Okay, question two, you're gonna need a pen and paper. So if you just grab uh, one of the poster notes on the table and a pen, don't write anything down just yet. I'm going to read out a series of words to you, and I want you to remember as many of those words as you can, and then when they disappear from the screen, I'll ask you to write them down, okay? So just listen for now. Okay, table, sit, legs, seat, couch, desk, recliner, sofa, wood, Cushion, swivel, stool, sitting, rocking, and bench. Okay, write as many of those down as you can remember. Okay, next question, by show of hands again. Imagine you're buying a new MacBook for $1,169 and you hear the exact same MacBook is available in another shop for $1,162, a 10 minute walk away. How many of you would walk to the other shop to get the cheaper MacBook? Okay, not so many. Great, I'll explain that in a moment, but just by way of introduction. So uh, I'm for the Behavioural Insights team, I head up the energy and sustainability work there, and the Behavioural Insights team uh, is an organisation that started life in 10 Downing Street, which is the Prime Minister's office in the UK. And we've since spun out of government, but our remit is essentially to apply what we call behavioural insights to public policy and other social impact objectives. So when we say behavioural insights, what we're talking about is findings from psychology, uh, economics, and in particular behavioural economics, uh, anthropology, and so on, combined with robust research and evaluation methods in order to try and supply a slightly more sophisticated and realistic understanding of human behavior into the way that policy is made or indeed campaigns and other sort of social impact uh, interventions and initiatives. So it's about understanding how people really behave in the real world, in other words, and how we can use that more realistic understanding to achieve our objectives. And one of the key theories that we draw on a lot, which many of you may well be familiar with, is this idea that we tend to think we're some two parallel systems. What Daniel Kahneman here, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2002, what he calls System 1 and System 2, or Thinking Fast and Slow, as the famous book uh, is titled that I'm sure many of you have read. But essentially what it says is that we, we have the ability to think quite sort of slowly, quite deliberatively, somewhat rationally, um, but actually a lot of our thinking happens very intuitively, very automatically, very rapidly. So for example, if I asked you what's two times two, you would give me a response without even thinking about it. If I asked you to take your daily commute to work, you could do that essentially on autopilot without giving it any thought. Whereas if I asked you to plan a trip to a country that you've never been to before, of course you need to think about that much more carefully. But the main insight is actually much more of our decision making and our behavior than we tend to realize is rooted in that system one, in that fast, automatic kind of thinking. And what that means is we're very, very sensitive to influence from our environment, because essentially we're walking around almost on autopilot a lot of the time, and so we're being very influenced by small details in our environment, sort of contextual factors. So for example, I asked you whether you'd walk 10 minutes to save $7 off of a MacBook, and I asked you whether you'd walk 10 minutes to save $7 off a belt. Almost all of you said you would do so for the belt, but very few of you said you would do so for the MacBook. Which does rather beg the question, would you walk 10 minutes for $7? So to a classical economist, that's exactly the same situation. But of course, to a psychologist, to a human being, it's not the same situation. We tend to be sensitive to the context in which that 
sort of uh, that choice set is, is framed. So technically, this is what we call a proportional price evaluation, which is that we tend to perceive prices not in objective absolute terms, but of course proportionally. So $7 off of 15 is much more significant than $7 off of 1,000. So the key insight there is that context really, really matters a lot, of course, but also that we tend to have these sort of biases that distort our judgment in quite predictable uh, ways. Another example, if I offered you uh, a coffee and I said, please choose which size coffee you want, the majority of people opt for the medium. Of course, there's some variety there, but most people will go for the medium. And you ask them why, and they say, well, the small one's a bit too small for me, the big one's a bit too big for me, the medium is the right size. You then get, put a bigger one there, and you take away the small one, and you offer them the new set, and you say, which one do you want? And they say, I'll have the medium, please. And you ask them why, and they say, well, the small one's a bit too small, the big one's a bit too big, the medium is the right size. So of course, what's happening there is our choice is entirely influenced by the way that the choice set is framed to us, but we're kind of retrospectively overlaying a more objective, rational uh, explanation to that decision. But really, it's the environment that's steering us more than our sort of objective, rational judgment. And this is sort of a cognitive equivalent of uh, the sort of visual illusions, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. So if you look at the two squares there, they were A and B, uh, of course, in this context, we know it's a visual illusion, or I wouldn't be presenting it. But nonetheless, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would say that A looks uh, rather uh, dark than B, but actually, they are exactly the same shade of gray. And so we can see this quite intuitively when it's presented to us as a visual illusion. But the point is our brain works like this in all manner of ways, including when we're making judgments and decisions uh, in the world around us. Sorry. Um, OK, so let's see. Do you remember these words? So by show of hands, who amongst you got table? OK, great. That one tends to be quite easy because it was at the beginning of the list. So we tend to remember that more easily. What about desk? Yeah, not so many. OK. Cushion. OK. Oops. Sit. OK, that's pretty impressive. And chair. All right, well, that one is most impressive because chair wasn't actually on the list. <laughs> so well done to those of you that got that. Um, so, of course, what that shows, again, is simply that our brain tends to work in ways which are quite opaque to us. Uh, of course, our memory is not a perfect storage of data and information. It works through association in this case. Of course, all of these words kind of associated with the word chair. But again, it's just a fun way to highlight that we don't often know what's going on in our brains. We make decisions and recall information, form memories in ways that are quite uh, intriguing. Um, and so we can use this in a number of ways, all of these kind of behavioral insights, particularly in policy making. And policy makers tend to use a variety of uh, standard tools. So for example, we think about regulation, which is a behavior change tool, because you're talking about influencing people's behavior through the force of law or the threat of penalty. We could use incentives, so taxes, subsidies, grants, fines, etc. And that's about limiting and influencing behavior through some kind of economic cost or reward. We could use information campaigns, awareness raising, labels, and so on. So that aims to maintain people's freedom of choice, but it informs people, it persuades people. And behavioral insights offers us a fourth category, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is this idea of nudging. So that's essentially uh, the idea that you can gently influence people's behavior without necessarily restricting their choice by changing the environment they're in, changing the way information is presented, giving them small reminders and prompts, these sort of subtle ways, harnessing what we know about people's behavior to direct their choices without being too restrictive. So that's really all about behavioral insights, but one important point is that actually behavioral insights has a lot to say about these conventional methods as well. We can make information more effective by understanding how people interpret it, remember it, and so on. We can make incentives more effective by understanding the ways that people sometimes quite counterintuitively respond to incentives, and so on. So just to give you some examples of the kind of impacts you can have by drawing on these insights, one really powerful tool is to think about defaults. 
So if you default people into something, still allowing them to choose to do whatever they want, but the default is that they will get this service or they will be signed up for something, uh, then that can have an, an enormous impact. So for example, defaulting people into renewable electricity tariffs, there's a study in Germany that showed that led to a 10 times increase in the number of people on renewable electricity tariffs. And they still have exactly the same freedom of choice to choose what tariff they want, but the automatic one they get is the, is the green one. And that is far more effective than any kind of campaign trying to encourage people to proactively switch to a green tariff. And we see the same, by the way, in things like savings programs. If you default people into pension plans or rainy day savings programs, that's incredibly effective. We can also think about introducing or removing what we call small friction costs or points of hassle or inconvenience. Uh, so for instance, this image refers to a study which showed that simply removing the tray in a canteen environment reduced food waste by around 40%. Because then of course it's slightly more difficult to take too much food. You can still go back and get seconds and so on, but just because you can't easily overload your tray with all these items you're not going to eat, you can significantly reduce food waste. Similarly, in the UK in the mid-90s, regulations changed so that paracetamol could no longer be sold in the pots, but had to be sold in these blister packs, so you had to take them out individually, and there was a limitation on how much you could buy in a single shop in one go. And that led to a significant reduction in suicides from paracetamol, because now it's just slightly more difficult to get too much paracetamol or to take a lot in one go. And finally, we think a lot about social norms. So this is the idea that we're very much influenced by what other people are doing around us for various reasons. Uh, and so simply telling people what most people like them are doing can be quite influential. Uh, so we ran a trial with uh, HMRC, which is the tax authority in the UK. And by simply adding one sentence to a letter, which was nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time, which is true, and sending that letter to late payers, we brought forward 200 million pounds in late tax payments from a completely costless intervention, of course, because the letter's being sent out anyway, and we just added one sentence to that letter. So we can have surprisingly profound effects uh, from using these kind of techniques. Not always, we also often have very modest effects, but the point is they're often quite cost-effective uh, ways of intervening. So you're probably wondering now what all this has to do with uh, illegal or corrupt antisocial behavior and so on. So what I want to do now is I want to run through some of the sort of key insights that emerge from the research on this, and most of that tends to come from the laboratory. So the most common form of research on cheating, illegal behavior, and so on, is to set up sort of games so that people play games and then you observe how much they cheat, and you can change the conditions of those games to sort of mimic different scenarios. So it might feel a bit detached from the real world, but I want to go through some of these key insights and then I go through some of the kind of applications in the real world. But just to sort of, you know, I'm going to know false pretenses here. I don't have all the answers as to how this does apply to the illegal wildlife trade. But I hope there's enough here that we can have a bit of a conversation and some interesting things that might feel quite relevant. So I think the first thing to say is that uh, the rational choice idea, which tends to be the, the sort of set of ideas that dominates in policymakers' minds, is that illegal or corrupt or dishonest behavior emerges because, well, firstly, we are inherently selfish or self-interested individuals, um, and essentially the benefits of being dishonest outweigh the costs, um, and or there is a low risk of being caught or a, 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 an insignificant punishment. And so the implications of that would be that we should use some form of ban or regulation or a harsh penalty. Uh, in other words, we should ensure that actually the costs of cheating are higher than the benefits. Um, and we might do that by having stricter punishment or increasing the risk of someone being caught. That's sort of conventional wisdom. And of course, there is a lot of truth to that. So I'm not going to say that's wrong. That is an important part of the question. But it's not the whole picture. Partly because we know that bans and regulations often don't work. So to give you an obvious example of where a ban doesn't work, trying to ban alcohol consumption. I mean, that's been tried historically in a number of places, and it's consistently failed. And the reason for that is it has a lot of sort of characteristics which are just not well suited to a ban. So for example, the market for alcohol is very established, so you're trying to stop something that's already widespread and has a very established market. 
uh, and consumers already have a very strong motivation to continue drinking. There's not an easy sort of substitute, so people will tend to find a way. Secondly, the production and supply of alcohol tends to be distributed, so actually enforcement and targeting or enforcement is very difficult. And thirdly, legal alternatives to alcohol are not particularly obvious or available. And finally, the activity of drinking tends to be quite private, or certainly it can be private, so again, actually enforcement or monitoring is incredibly difficult as well. So in those kind of situations, bans and regulations are often quite ineffective. Just by way of contrast, someone asked me recently whether I thought a ban on plastic drinking straws was a good idea in the UK. And I thought, actually, yes, it probably is, because in a sense, it has characteristics that are very different. So firstly, actually, the motivations to use a straw are relatively weak. Most of us are quite happy to have a drink without a straw. Secondly, production and retail of straws is quite easy to actually monitor if you're targeting shops. <clears throat> and thirdly, actually, the selling of them and the use of them is largely public. And legal alternatives, in other words, you know, very rapidly the market will produce paper straws or bamboo straws or whatever. So in that instance, a ban would tend to be quite effective. So we have this sort of spectrum of different situations where bans and regulations may be effective or ineffective. So an obvious question is, well, where does poaching, trading, and consumption of illegal wildlife products sit on that? I would argue probably somewhere in the middle, but perhaps slightly more to the left in many regards. So clearly there can be huge successes from banning products. We've seen that in China, but it's not going to achieve the whole thing. And there are certain challenges there with using bans. So we want to think about other ways to sort of supplement and improve that. So what other behavioral factors drive dishonest behavior? Okay, so here's a few sort of nuggets, a few uh, insights that come from the research. So firstly, the idea of normalization. If everybody else seems to be doing it, then we're happy doing it. Secondly, this idea of omission bias. What that essentially means is we're much more willing to be dishonest or cheat by omission, in other words, by not doing something, than we are to be dishonest or cheat by proactively doing something. So to give you an everyday example, imagine you're in a shop um, and you're buying something, you're very unlikely to deliberately try and scam the shopkeeper and give them too little money. That would be quite an extreme thing to do. But if they accidentally give you too much change and you notice that, many of us might just sort of let that go and just take a change. So we're much more likely to allow something dishonest to happen that favors us than we are to proactively do something that's dishonest. Thirdly, this idea of a sort of fudge factor, which essentially means that a lot of us tend to be slightly dishonest, and as long as we're only slightly dishonest, we can sort of find an excuse for that. And in fact, if we've not been as dishonest as we could have been, we might even think of ourselves as quite good people because we've actually refused the opportunity to really cheat, so we've just taken a little bit. And I'll show you some research in a moment that shows actually most of us tend to do that. Fourthly, this idea of categorization. So if it's not money, if it's something else, we're more likely to take a favor or a gift. Next, splitting the spoils. So if you're doing it for someone else's benefit, or if you're sharing the outcome of your dishonesty, that tends to license it a bit more, and we're more inclined to be dishonest. That's very relevant, of course. Some of the conversations yesterday, we were talking about people buying tiger amulets for a family member, people buying pangolin scales because they feel like they really want the, you know, the best medication for a family member. Uh, if you feel like it's not in your interest, then that really removes that sort of guilt, guilt factor. Uh, somewhat relatedly is this idea of moral licensing. So we tend to use a previous good act or we tend to focus on our virtues and our integrity in order to justify a subsequent bad act. Or indeed, if something bad has happened to us, maybe because we feel we're not paid enough, for example, we use that as an excuse to sort of morally make the bad behavior acceptable. The lack of a victim, of course, if you feel that you know the animal is dead anyway, it wasn't me. That could be very relevant. And so all of these things are sort of forms of what I would call fudge factors or rationalizations. We draw on these sort of excuses to justify our bad behavior. And of course, the, what makes them so effective is there's often a bit of truth in them. But nonetheless, we sort of stretch that to our advantage. But then there are also some sort of circumstantial factors which also exacerbate dishonesty. 
So things like scarcity, by which I mean, if the opportunity to benefit from dishonesty is running out, if there's like a last opportunity, we tend to go for it and try and you know, get the most we can. Um, and similarly, the fact that um, if, if dishonesty is very easy, it's very easy to cheat and the opportunity is right there, we will tend to do so more. So that's a, sort of an idea of friction or hassle. If it's, if it's a bit more difficult to be dishonest, that can be quite effective. So I'm going to run through some of these sort of games, these sort of laboratory experiments I mentioned. So please, while I'm doing so, have a think in your mind of how might this be relevant to my context? Because it's not necessarily immediately obvious when you look at these slightly abstract experiments, but I think within each of them there's quite an interesting insight. Um, so this is a, a quote from uh, some of the most seminal research on dishonesty, and the way they summarize their findings is that people generally like to think of themselves as honest. However, dishonesty pays, and it often pays well. So how do people resolve this tension? Well, their research shows that people tend to behave dishonestly enough that they can profit from that, but honestly enough to continue deluding themselves of their own integrity. So a little bit of dishonesty gives a taste of the profit without actually spoiling that sort of positive uh, self-image. And you might be thinking, well, yeah, okay, not me. But actually, the evidence suggests that most of us do this, whether it's just sort of stretching your timesheet a little bit, uh, whether it's maybe being a bit generous on your expenses claim. We tend to sort of fudge things ever so slightly. So I'll give you a bit of evidence of that. So this is a, a typical sort of uh, laboratory study, where in this case, the researchers set up a series of maths tests. Um, and the idea was that you got a payment depending how many questions you got right. But the number of questions you got right was totally self-reported. So it depended on you being honest. And then at the end of the test, you went and you put your test in a shredder. So you, had, you were convinced that the researcher wouldn't know how many you got right. But actually, the shredder was fake. It didn't actually shred the paper. Um, so then you can observe, well, how many do people actually get right and how many are they claiming they got right in order to get the payment? Um, and so what happened here, there were 20 questions. On average, people actually got four of them right out of 20, so I'm just sort of a tight time limit. Um, but people on average claim they got six right. Um, and this has been going on for a number of years. And these researchers have now done this with 40,000 people, which is a huge sample size for this kind of uh, experiment. Um, but what's really interesting is only 20 people out of that 40,000 went full hog and claimed they got 20 right. You know, there was any, anyone could have done that. There was no consequences. You could have all just said, yeah, I got them all right, I'll take the money. But very, very few people do that. But the majority, so 28,000 out of the 40,000, were sort of minor cheaters. And then they just nudged their score up a little bit. And they can probably justify that to themselves. Like, oh, you know, I, I almost got that one right. Or I probably would have done it if I had like another 10 seconds or whatever. So 70% of us tend to cheat a little bit. A similar study. Imagine you get given a dice, you're asked to roll it, and you get a payment depending on the number on the dice. If you get a six, you get nothing at all. But if you get a one, two, three, four, or five, you get one, two, three, four, or five Swiss francs, depending on that role. Um, and again, this is done anonymously, so you just have to tell the researcher what you rolled to get the money. So of course, you would expect that one sixth of people would get each one. And if you do this over a large number of people, you can obviously look at the extent to which people are cheating. And what we find, of course, is that no, not one-sixth of people seem to get each roll. Rather, a lot of people seem to roll a five. Um, so 35% of people roll a five. That's the maximum payout. Very few people roll a six, which is zero payout. Um, but what's interesting is that actually not everybody cheats maximally again. Not everyone goes for the five. A lot of people are saying they got a four. So they're not getting the maximum payout there, but they're just nudging themselves up a little bit. And there's a really interesting follow-up to this study, where if the maximum payout was on a three rather than a five, um, even more people claimed they got a three, because there, there are two ways you can cheat just a little bit. I.e., if you roll a two or a four, you could just sort of nudge that to a three. Whereas if a six was the maximum payout, or in this case five, with a six being nothing, there there's only one way you can cheat a little bit towards the maximum, i.e. if you roll a four. So, we are absolute consummate uh, geniuses of the way we sort of find these intricate ways to sort of benefit ourselves without undermining too much our sense of integrity. 
So let's see what happens if you add in a few other variables. Let's say uh, rather than uh, getting money with this, this is again the same sort of maths quiz experiment, rather than getting money, you get tokens, and then you exchange those tokens for money. So this puts an additional step between the cheating and the money. And the hypothesis is that actually we're much more likely to cheat when it's not for money. You know, when it's money, it's a bit more visceral and we feel a bit more guilty. So if you can distance yourself from the money, we're more likely to cheat. And that is exactly what they found. So uh, don't worry about reading all of that, but essentially the level of cheating more or less doubled when you have these tokens. So um, 3.5 questions out of 20 was the number that people actually got right. People that were given money claimed they got 6.2. People that were uh, getting tokens claim they got 9.4, so it's a rough, roughly doubling of, of the cheating. Okay, I'll skip over that. Okay, what about another um, sort of variable we can add into the mix? This idea that you're doing it for someone else's benefit or you're uh, sharing the spoils, the money. So this is a, another sort of similar experiment where people were given essentially an unsolvable puzzle. There was no correct answer to this puzzle, so anybody that claimed they solved it is lying. Uh, when they're just taking the money themselves, 21% of people claim they solved it, 21% seem to be lying. But when you're in a situation where you're sharing that money with someone else, it doubled to 43% of people claiming that they solved the puzzle. And again, I hope you can immediately see the sort of relevance of this, that we tend to rationalize these things along the lines of, well, you know, it's not for me, it's for the benefit of my family that I'm doing this. Or, um, you know, I will if you will. There's a sense of collusion if you're maybe with a colleague and, and two, two people are being corrupt and so on. So it's very dangerous when there are these sort of social licensing effects where other people's benefit sort of licenses your ability to do the wrong thing. And a related concept to this is what if you observe other people cheating? And of course, this is a huge problem with corruption, systemic corruption, where it's completely normalized. If you're in a, in a situation where many other people are doing it, you're much more likely to do it. And that's essentially what this study found. Again, it's another variation of this sort of maths test experiment, um, but actually they had an actor in the room, someone who was pretending to also be taking this test, who was who very obviously cheated. They, they claimed to have finished the whole quiz in like a minute and just claim the full marks and take all the money, very you know, uh, obviously. So uh, it was clear to the, the real participants that actually there was cheating going on. But what's interesting is that they manipulated the extent whether that person looked like someone that's sort of like you in your in-group, and that was done by they belonged to the same university, they were wearing a sort of university jumper, or they belonged to a competitive university that there was some rivalry between. And where the person cheating was your in-group, i.e. you perceived them to be like you, and they cheated, you cheated much more as well. But where they were an out-group, and they looked, you perceived them as different, actually you cheated less, because you wanted to sort of differentiate yourselves from their behavior. So there's something really interesting about perception of identity there, if you're trying to stop cheating or dishonest behavior from spreading. Okay. Um, now, in the real world, there's some interesting evidence of this as well. It's what we call the broken windows effect, which shows that, again, dishonest behavior or petty crime uh, can really spread if it's perceived to be normal. So a series of experiments here have shown that um, with littering, for example, if you have a street like this and it's covered in graffiti, people are much more likely to litter than if it's not covered in graffiti. So in other words, one sort of evidence of one crime can actually exacerbate another crime. Uh, so in this instance, where there was no graffiti, about 30% of people littered, and this was done experimentally by putting leaflets on people's bikes and seeing if they chuck them in the bin or just chuck them on the floor. So 30% of people put them on the floor. Whereas if there was graffiti on the walls, that roughly doubled, or more than doubled, to nearly 70% of people. So again, this is a sort of quite powerful evidence that our perception of what's going on and what's normal and what's sort of acceptable is a really strong influence on our propensity to be dishonest or undertake antisocial behavior. And that's been replicated in a number of different sort of contexts. So for example, there's also evidence that graffiti increases the number of people stealing cash from a letterbox. Again, this is an experiment where they had some uh, some cash sticking out of an envelope in a letterbox in someone's house, uh, and that roughly doubled the number of people stealing it if there was graffiti in the area. Um, if there was litter on the floor, that also significantly increased the number of people stealing. Um, and if there were bikes even just locked up illegally on a fence that said, do not like your bikes here, uh, that also increased the number of people trespassing across a, 
a route they weren't supposed to go through. So these they're maybe slightly sort of abstract uh, scenarios, but altogether it's quite quite convincingly shows that actually we tend to be much more dishonest and willing to partake in, in sort of you know mildly illegal behaviours when other people appear to be doing so as well. Okay. So what can we do about any of this? Well, I think the first thing we need to think about is this idea of normalization. If everybody else is doing it, it's fine for me to do it. That's a big problem. Now, one technique that we've used to good effect for this in other contexts, sorry, is this idea of highlighting the good, the desirable social norms. So telling people actually, you know what, most people don't do this. Most people are doing the right thing. And the reason for that is that we have a very skewed perception, sort of conveniently skewed perception of what most people are doing. So this is one st just one study that we did with Ipsos Mori, uh, just looking at the difference in people's perceptions of how many people actually avoid their tax and the reality. And people tend to believe that about 36% of other people are not fully paying their tax. The reality is nearly 6%. So if we have a really skewed perception of other people's dishonesty, and we know that other people's dishonesty promotes their own dishonesty, that's a bit of a problem. But of course, it also suggests a solution. We can just update people's beliefs. We can tell them it's a true fact. So that was the basis of the study I mentioned earlier, where when we just added that one sentence, nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time into the tax letters, was enough to bring forward 200 million pounds in late tax payments. But this has also been shown to be effective in a wide range of contexts, particularly across some sustainability uh, issues. So for example, you've probably all seen these little tags in hotel rooms, encouraging you to reuse your towel, and normally they're based on an environmental message. And so in this particular study, the message that was, you know, really generic, uh, please reuse your towel to save the environment, etc., about 35% of people did. If you don't even mention the environment, and you just say most previous occupants of this room reuse their towel, 49% of people reuse it. So that seems to be more effective than promoting a sort of environmentally based good thing is actually just to tell people that actually most people are doing this. So we can think about trying to use that to sort of crack um, instances where people are being dishonest or, or indeed selfish or not contributing uh, to uh, a public good in, in the context of sustainable resource, for example. Um, a related idea is this idea of making behaviours much more, more observable. So we are much more inclined to uh, do the expected good thing when we're being observed. Uh, this is a very sort of core tenet of, of psychology. When you think about that norms and conformity tend to work, we conform to the expected norm behavior uh, more so when we're being observed. And again, there are a number of studies that have shown this to be effective. So I'll, just, I'll go through these very quickly. There's a lot of information on these slides, but you will be able to uh, keep the slides, so they should be kind of self-explanatory for you if you want to read them after us. But for example, donations to a national park were increased when they were made sort of transparent. So you could, you can just put it in a black box, but people could see how much you're giving, and that increased the volume of donations. Uh, in situations where payments are based on sort of honesty, uh, you know, when there's nobody there and you just have to put the money in a box, this one has mixed evidence, but there's a bit of evidence to suggest that even just something as simple as putting a pair of eyes on a poster above that box can increase payments because that tendency to be sensitive to the fact that we're being watched is so deeply ingrained in us that that seems to have a bit of a, a bit of an effect. You can use fake police officers to reduce traffic offences. I'm not sure that little guy with a hairdryer is the best example I've seen, but uh, nonetheless, that seems to work. Um, and of course, I know that some uh, conservation organisations, including Rare, tend to use sort of public pledges. Uh, to, to, to encourage people to you know, stop overfishing and so on. And the point there is that by pledging publicly, so there's a sort of social cost to going against that pledge, uh, can be quite effective. So what about this point that most of us tend to cheat a little bit, but then we sort of rationalize it, we make excuses for ourselves. How, we might, how might we be able to address that? Well, one sort of category of intervention ideas is this idea, well, there's, there's presumably a bit of a, sort of a limit as to how much dishonesty we can reasonably excuse ourselves for before we start to feel a bit bad about it. So can we reduce the extent of dishonesty which we're able to sort of rationalize to ourselves? And one way of doing that is to try and elevate the sort of more positive aspects of our nature. 
Um, so, for example, by reinforcing an identity of virtue through a sense of national pride or duty or indeed religion has been shown to be effective uh, in some situations. And then separately, the, uh, one of the other issues we talked about was this idea of omission bias, which is that we tend to be more willing to be dishonest when it just sort of happens and we let it go rather than proactively doing something. So there we might think about, well, how can we sort of reframe the crime as though it's a proactive decision so we don't let people sort of make that excuse. So we tested both of these ideas, and again, this is in the context of tax avoidance. This one's in Guatemala. Um, so we, we were sending out letters again to people to encourage them to declare their tax. Um, and we tried a variety of different letters. So the one that was around um, uh, national pride had some things about, you know, we, need, we really need this tax money to spend it on critical public services, um, uh, you know, please be an honest citizen, and so on. Um, those kind of messages. Uh, we, we also tried a social norm. So in this case, we can't say 9 out of 10 people pay their tax, because they don't. Uh, we can say 64.5% of Guatemalans declared their income tax, which is quite low, um, so, but we were interested to see if that worked. Um, and then the sort of omission bias one here is trying to reframe it as a proactive dishonest behavior. So this says, previously we've considered your failure to declare your tax an oversight. However, if you don't declare now, we will consider it an active choice. You may therefore be audited and could face the procedure established by law. So these are the results from a randomized controlled trial. So I won't bother explaining what that is, but essentially this is a sort of robust uh, estimate of the, of the impact of each of the different letters we did. So from left to right there, we have a control group that didn't receive any letters. And this is the average number, uh, so the average amount paid or declared in tax per uh, participant in this study, essentially. We then sent out the original letter that the Guatemalan authorities had written. That was slightly better than having no letter at all. A behavioral letter was exactly the same as the original one, we just simplified it slightly to make it easier to understand, had a sort of very small impact. The national pride one, where we injected this sense of uh, national pride, you know, good citizens pay their tax, etc., that seemed to bump it up quite a bit, which was encouraging. The social norms one, even more so, despite it only saying that 65% of people pay their tax on time, that's still encouraged, that's still you know, higher than most people thought it was, so it still worked. Um, and then finally, that deliberate choice one, where we say, you know, previously we'll accept it was an oversight, but this time, if you don't do it, we'll take it as a choice. Uh, that roughly tripled the amount of tax collected relative to sending no letter, or doubled it relative to the Guatemalan's uh, original letter. So quite simply, sort of reframing the issue there can be quite effective. Okay, I better speed up a bit. Um, just to expand on that point around sort of trying to uh, accentuate people's sense of virtue or their identity of sort of good behavior, religious commitments is one way that's been tested in a number of contexts to good effect. And so going back to our, uh, our familiar study of sort of doing maths tests in, the, uh, in a laboratory, um, the way they tested this there is that they, they split them into two groups. One of the groups were just asked to write down the name of 10 books they'd read recently, which is just a, a sort of spurious control group, doesn't really achieve anything, but the other group were asked to write down all they could remember from the Ten Commandments. And these weren't particularly the religious people, it was just uh, uh, it was an American population, uh, but nonetheless it's a sort of priming thing, it sort of prompts people to think about uh, honesty and so on. Um, and they found that actually that more or less removed the cheating element. Uh, so by having that moral prompt dropped the number of tests that they claimed to get right, from 4.2 to 2.8, which was back in line with roughly how many they were getting right. So that more or less removed the cheating. Um, and there are a number of ways you can think about priming people with a sense of honesty, um, some of which have good evidence, some of them don't so much, but they're perhaps worth exploring. So for example, you can use sort of more ceremonial or sort of ritualistic um, uh, you know, for example, if you join a police force, you might go through some kind of very uh, pompous sort of ceremony in order to really embody you with that sense of uh, professional identity. Um, uniforms, for example, there's mixed evidence on this, but there is some evidence that suggests that a, a uniform can help um, strengthen that sense of sort of professional identity. That said, it can also give a sense of power that can be abused, so it's not, it's not clear-cut, the evidence on that. Um, 
dailies of a declaration. So an obvious example of that is the American Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. But you can imagine a sort of similar uh, technique to that in order to try and embody this sort of strong identity of honesty and integrity. Or indeed, as I mentioned with that rare example previously, sort of public pledges. Because we tend to be more consistent with ourselves when we're sort of observed by others and we sort of publicly pledged the intention. Okay, finally, moving away from this sort of fudge factor type thing, what about contextual factors? Well, one thing we know is that hassle, convenience, what we call friction costs, so sort of small points of effort, can be really disproportionately impactful from our behaviors, uh, from our propensity to sort of complete a behavior. So. so if we add in a friction, if we make being dishonest just slightly more difficult, it doesn't need to be an all out ban, but if we just make it slightly more difficult, it can be disproportionately effective. So for example, there's a really great, uh, interesting study um, from Germany that showed that when uh, legislation was changed to mandate the use of helmets, motorcycle thefts dropped by 60%. And the reason for that is that it is no longer easy to opportunistically steal a motorbike, because if you don't happen to have a helmet with you, you'll get pulled <laughs> over for not wearing a helmet, and then the police officer will know that you've stolen the bike. So it's a sort of like, you know, unintended but very positive consequence. And interestingly, there was no sort of spillover effect to an increase in deaths of other vehicles. I mentioned the paracetamol example earlier, but I think it's a really powerful example of how introducing a small friction can still significantly reduce quite profound behaviors that you would think people would be intent on doing. But of course, in reality, a lot of suicides are done in the sort of heat of the moment because there's an opportunity, because they're feeling particularly uh, desperate at that moment. So if you can just add in those barriers, that can actually be quite effective. And perhaps my favorite example of a, of a sort of behavior informed incentive, this is from China. So in order to reduce uh, tax avoidance among firms, what they did was they put a state mandated lottery ticket on the back of receipts. So what essentially that meant is that uh, shoppers would ask for a receipt because they wanted the lottery ticket, and by producing a receipt, it was then slightly more difficult for the firms to avoid tax because they had the receipt on their books. And so that significantly reduced tax evasion by companies. Uh, and the interesting point there is that because we tend to overestimate small probabilities and we focus kind of on the size of the prize rather than the sort of true expected, you know, very low value, because actually the odds of winning were incredibly low. So the expected value of that, of that lottery is quite low, um, but we don't focus on that. We focus on the possibility of winning. So that was a very effective incentive to discourage uh, tax evasion. Okay, so quite a lot gone through that. I'd be really interested to hear your ideas as to how this might apply to the legal wildlife trade. But just to sort of summarize, so this idea of rational, self-interested behavior, it's obviously a really important part of the problem, so we do need to still consider conventional methods like bans and enforcement and adjusting the incentives and so on. Um, but of course, that is not the whole picture. They can sometimes be ineffective, but they also overlook sort of more uh, irrational, non-rational aspects of human nature. So one of the key insights is that actually all of us tend to cheat a little bit. We tend to fudge or sort of rationalize a bit of selfish or dishonest or cheating behavior to just the, the right extent we can get away with doing that without losing our sense of integrity or honesty. Um, so if we can find ways to remove that sort of fudge factor, that can be quite effective. So we just discussed ideas like highlighting the positive social norms, so you can't make that excuse, oh, everybody's doing it. Um, making the action explicit, so in other words, you know, you're doing this deliberately, this is not just by omission. Um, or trying to promote people's sense of pro-social identity through things like uniforms or moral or religious prompts. Um, and again, we talked about sort of small contextual details, including sort of friction costs and also how observable a behavior is. But just to say, of course, we've only scratched the surface here. So I'm sure you can all think of things that we haven't talked about that are relevant. So we haven't talked about, for example, messenger effects, which is the fact that we're much more likely to pay attention to certain people than others. We haven't talked about how we can think about designing incentives to be more effective in order to encourage whistleblowing or uh, other activities. We haven't talked about education. We haven't talked about empathy building, such as you know, this idea that we're less likely to do something that harms a victim that's sort of identifiable rather than anonymous to us, and various other things. So really, this sort of scratches the surface, but I try to pick out things that maybe are less familiar 
um, and perhaps uh, uh, have some sort of novel application to the legal arbitrate. 